Welcome everyone to the final session of the MCIC series. Um, tonight we are partnering with the Pioneer Talks and this is our final session of the MCIC series. So I'm very excited and it has been a long and short month at the same time. So I wanna thank you all for participating tonight, those who have participated in other sessions, those who've simply helped spread the word or maybe watch recordings. Um, this has been a very fulfilling and rewarding month, and I'm really happy that we're ending with a partnership as our last event of the series. This series is hosted by the Department of Campus Climate, but as you know, we've had a lot of other partnerships that have got us here tonight and have helped with other events throughout the month. Caden is going to be sharing the community standards that we have for the MCIC series in the Zoom chat. We do expect folks to read and abide by these standards um, tonight. I will ask that at this time, if you are not speaking, to please mute your microphone. This just helps reduce background noise and is respectful to our presenters. Closed captioning is available for all of the series within, or all of the sessions within the MCIC series. You should be seeing closed captioning at the bottom of your screen at this time in a dark gray box. If you do not, please look for the CC or more button and click view live transcript. If you're having any difficulties with closed captioning or any other technical dif difficulties, please message us either publicly or privately in the Zoom chat. Most of the sessions during the MCIC series will be recorded. This is being done to make the sessions as accessible as possible for those who cannot attend live. And this session is being recorded um, now. The recordings will be made available up to three business days after the live session occurs. And you can view these on the Campus Climate YouTube channel or on the Campus Climate SharePoint site. If you have any questions, comments, or concerns about the MCIC series or anything related to campus climate, you can message us uh, tonight utilizing the Zoom chat or email us at campusclimate at uwplat.edu. I will be helping out um, Ray tonight with any Q&A that comes in. So feel free to also um, send any questions either publicly or if you send them privately i can share those questions or comments anonymously as well so please feel free to utilize the zoom chat uh, in relation to tonight's session as well and lastly i would like to introduce tonight's talk so um we are, again we are partnering with pioneer talks and tonight's session is student debt insights and impacts this is a co-sponsored event organized, hosted, and facilitated by Academic Affairs as part of UW-Platteville's weekly or lecture series, Pioneer Talks. This series features a curated mix of local and national experts guaranteed to inspire, motivate, and sometimes challenge. Student debt can be mind-boggling, but we are here to help. Join a panel of experts from across the university as they come together to discuss their experiences and offer insights to help you understand student debt. Get information from those who have been where you are now and learn about resources on campus that can help. I would now like to turn things over to Ray. Ray, you're still muted. Here we go, all right. Appreciate that, uh, Emily, for the introduction and thank you, Kaden, for getting me off that mute button there. Um, as Emily mentioned, this is a co-sponsored event between the MCIC and the Pioneer Talks Lecture Series. Uh, my name is uh, Dr. Raymond Pugh, Assistant Professor of uh, chemistry, Biochemistry in the Chemistry Department. And I will be serving as the uh, moderator uh, for this discussion. Um, so I'd just like to take a quick moment to kind of give you an outline of the format of the discussion. So basically, I will either give a statement or pose a question, and I will direct it to a particular uh, panelist, and that panelist will speak for about three to four minutes. Um, and then there will be about a two to three minute window in which any other panelist can follow up to contribute. And then we have set aside about a two to three minute window um, for the questions from the audience. So that's uh, 
If you have a question that comes to mind while the feature panelist is speaking or to, during the follow-up, you can uh, chat, uh, send a chat, your question to Emily or uh, myself, and then we can try to answer it directly. Uh, if, no, if you don't have any questions or they come up at a later time, we are gonna try to leave a little bit of window for Q&A at the very end. All right, so without further ado, to make sure we stay on track of time, I'll give the, uh, each of the panelists an opportunity to introduce themselves, and then we're gonna get started right away. Um, so first off, uh, Laura. Hi, I'm Laura Franklin, and I am an executive director within diversity and inclusion. Next will be Brenda. Hello, my name is Brenda Gomez Solis. I'm the Hispanic Outreach Specialist uh, within the Office of Multicultural Student Affairs at UWP. Next we have Michael. I knew I would forget to take the mute, the mute that thing off. So good evening, Mike Hoosier. Uh, I am one of our assistant directors of financial aid here at UW Platinum. Next we have Kaya. Good evening, my name is Kaya Hendrickson. I'm the Director of Academic Advising in Academic Support Programs. Thank you. Next we have Tammy. Hi everybody, Tammy Salmon Stevens. I direct the College of Engineering, Math and Science Student Success Programs. And last but not least, we have Jeremy. What's going on everybody? My name is Jeremy Payne and I go by JP for short and I'm an instructor on campus for the Ethnic Studies Program. All right. Thank you, everyone. All right, so let's get right into the discussion itself here. Um, so in 2017, there was a published article by scholars from the University of Michigan, which indicated that the financial aid process is actually becoming more increasingly complex and that first generation students borrow more frequently and in greater amounts than their peers. Additionally, families of first-generation students are unable or unaware of their ability to pay the expected financial contribution to offset the amount of aid needed. Now, fast forward to a recent online article in August 2020, and it mentions that Pell Grants cover just 59% of tuition and fees. So this is an indication that federal aid is not keeping up with the rising cost of higher ed. So as a result, low-income students have to take on loans uh, which contribute uh, to their increase in debt. So Laura, would you be able to provide some insight on the challenges families of first-generation students face in applying for financial aid and why the burden of borrowing money has increased with rising higher education costs? Sure, and um, thank you for giving me the opportunity to discuss something that's both personally and professionally um, really near and dear to my heart, and that's educational access for first-generation and low-income college students. I think for first-generation students, the challenge starts, we have to go all the way back to the FAFSA. Um, and I think we make assumptions that students and families even know what that is and how that process might work. And so not having the, the support available in completing the FAFSA um, contributes to, uh, I think, this, this fear and this sense of overwhelmingness. But then once a student is awarded an aid package, um, a a first-generation student and their family don't have the experience um, firsthand to understand what is on that package. And even for those of us that, you know, spend time explaining those packages, there's things like work study, which is, is really kind of confusing and hard to explain to students. And so I, I think students and families become overwhelmed. Um, they lack the confidence to maybe ask the questions that they might need or want to ask. Um, they don't know who to ask the questions to, and um, that, that, that leads to kind of a, a lack of confidence and stress from the very beginning of a student's educational journey. As far as, uh, you know, I really believe that we're getting to a point where higher education is pricing out low-income students. Um, and, and it's something that's gravely concerning to me. So when you say that 58% of a student's package is uh, just their tuition and fees is covered by the Pell Grant, that means 41% of their tuition and their fees or 42% plus all of their housing and all of their dining, none of that is being covered by a grant, which would be the money that they don't need to pay back. 
And it's rare these days where a student, even if they're utilizing the subsidized loans, the Stafford loans available from the government, um, students still have a lot of unmet need and have to still take on a lot of loan debt. Um, again, it's a very confusing and fearful process uh, for a first generation family. But when a student starts school, and if it's a student from a low income background and they start school and, and the day they arrive and they're given the package and they see that they owe $1,000, $2,000, $3,000 and, and they don't have the capacity to come up with that funding, they're, they're starting their educational journey from a very stressful um, vantage point from the very beginning. All right, thanks a lot, Laura. Does, uh, any of the other panelists um, have anything to add or contribute to that? Well, um, I'll just bring up my own personal experience and that kind of my role here um, as well as not just a moderator, but um, just kind of talk from personal experience as a low income first generation student myself um, when I was in uh, undergrad. And you're, you're right about that FAFSA form, like really not knowing about and how to you know, go through that process. And as a result of that unfamiliarity, um, I ended up submitting mine late. And the impact of submitting it late was my first semester, I was not able to get aid. And so I was originally supposed to go to Drexel University, which is a big engineering school in Philadelphia. And I had gone to the orientation and everything for that over summer. But then August rolls around and the financial aid office is like, well, you know, since your aid package didn't get to get submitted till late, the first semester, you're gonna have to shell out $10,000. <laughs> it was like, well, I don't have $10,000. So I was not able to go to Drexel University. It was perhaps a blessing in disguise in the long run, but I should not have been in that position in the first place. I should have been able to go for that first semester to my college of choice but I was unable to do that. Um, and so I had to then just go to the community college um, for the first year, just to be able to maintain and get credit because I didn't want any time off. And then I worked and then I transferred into the, the university that I ended up graduating from. But certainly from personal experience, those FAFSA forms were confusing and not knowing how to navigate that, even with the help of the guidance counselor, it was still a challenge to be able to figure that all out and the impact it had being late was if you if you don't get it on time they get to go by you know how much money they have to the university and all that and if you're late they're just not going to have enough left over to give you the package right away right i'll, I'll share a little piece of my personal story and, and i don't share this often but i remember it vividly um I, about a year before i went to college my father passed away and so when I arrived, my FAFSA, which was called something different back then, was not accurate. And my mom attempted to call the financial aid office and discuss this. And, and I don't think she understood what they were trying to tell her and vice versa. And so she called me and I can tell you where I was in my dorm room at that time. She called me and said, um, I think you're gonna have to come home because I can't figure out your financial aid and I, I can't seem to get it together. And I was maybe two weeks into school. I didn't know any professionals on campus. I didn't have anyone to ask about that. And, but I knew my mom and if my mom said, you're going to have to come home. Um, and I had a strong desire to not place any greater burden on her. Um, it, it's just, it's sad and gravely concerning to me that students not understanding their, their aid package and the, package and benefits they're entitled to can stop out of school because of that. Absolutely. All right, so we do have a question from the audience. Um, and that one is, um, what do you think about the move to have tuition waived? What would the cost be to have so-called free tuition and the pros and cons of it? And anybody can take that one. <laughs> Well, I, you know, I, I can help you on a little bit, um, and I, I don't want to get into all the specifics because I, I don't know the specifics of it. But just thinking off the top of my head, there there are pros to it in that 
does higher education, you know, does higher education become more accessible for more students? Absolutely. Um, with that being said, we still have to have the infrastructure in place to make sure that students can succeed. And, and those, those tuition costs, the revenue, that does, you know, help fund positions on campus. So um, I think sometimes in theory, that sounds really good, um, but there's a lot of details that would have to be sorted out with something like that. I do think one of the exciting things, and, and we've been through a lot in the last year with the, with the pandemic and so forth, um, a lot of these issues have really been brought to the forefront and are open for discussion right now. So, um, you know, will something like that happen? I don't know. Um, but I think there's definitely discussion. There are those discussions are being had, um, maybe not directly with, with in administrative positions, but I know like in our office, we've talked about that. So what the details look like, I, I could not begin to tell you. Okay. Does anybody have any other comment to make about that question? Ray, I've been, this is Tammy. I've been thinking about it um, and listening to Mike. And um, I, yeah, there's, it's definitely up for debate, right? To think about because I paid for all my education, either through scholarships or working. And, and certainly it was a burden and a stress. Um, and I shouldn't say but, but and at the same time, there was a sense of pride, right, in being able to say that, you know, I, you know, I, I did it, right. So, um, and then there's also this sense of commitment, right. So I know when we um, offer outreach programs, right, we, we do charge 10 or $15 or whatever, right. So, so there's, there's they have, people have skin in the game, right. And so sometimes when you offer things for free, I wonder if people will put the same effort in, right? Um, and I'm not saying I, that people will or people won't, right? I'm just, just thinking about that. Um, and right now the current process is scholarships, right? Like we'll, we'll charge you tuition, but then you can you know, apply for scholarships. And, and I think that's a bigger topic, right? Is, is how do you prepare for writing those scholarships and what does that mean? Because a lot of scholarships go unawarded. Um, a, lot of, a lot of federal work study goes unaccepted. Um, so I, you know, that, I don't know, that's where I'm at. I don't know if anybody else wants to add. Uh, so so those are a direct question that came through or at least a comment that was made and it's um, certainly uh, relevant. Uh, and so it's saying, um, the discussion may be uh, overlooking students from wealthier families per se, and that they don't receive financially, uh, financial assistance from their parents. Um, and because of the, the uh, parents being from wealthier side, that they may not get grants or few loans due to their parents' financial status. So it's asking why is the FAFSA based on parental income at all? Um, because parents are not obligated to contribute to their adult children's uh, college. Yeah, I, you know, that's a great question. I might be able to answer something to that. Okay. When, when you start talking about uh, each student being their own entity, so to speak, the, the FAFSA that we had mentioned that, that you fill out, it has some parameters that help determine eligibility. And the question that was asked, they're right. If the, if the parents, if their adjusted gross income is high, those students are not going to receive Pell Grants and, and other grant opportunities. The issue if each student filled out their own FAFSA and there were not parameters set on it, is there would be like no grant money available. Because you have to remember the FAFSA is not just a UW Platteville document. This is a nationwide document for all schools. So ultimately there's only so much funding. Um, I was at a conference at one time several years back and that question was asked and I never really knew the answer to it. The reality of it is there just there would be limited funding for everyone, maybe not even enough to go around. And the reason for that is when students fill that out, they would all be very low expected family contribution. So they'd be eligible for very high amounts of Pell Grants. And that would that would greatly impact the, you know, the, the purpose of that program. Thanks a lot, Mike. 
Yeah, and I think that's a good point. It's about that expected family contribution. So the, the, at the end of the day is, you know, they are basing on how much can the family contribute. You're absolutely right that the family does not have to, but that may be a discussion then with the family. But ultimately what the student would have to do then is just like pers a person of low income trying to minimize the loan debt, look for scholarships, you know, and things of that nature. Okay, so we need to move on to the next uh, panel uh, discussion here. So make sure we're staying on time. Okay, so the population of students though with perhaps an even more challenging task of navigating the financial aid process and finding aid in which they are in fact eligible for are undocumented students. Because as undocumented students, uh, they are ineligible for federal financial aid. So Brenda, given your role on campus as the Hispanic outreach uh, specialist, and not to say that all undocumented students are just Hispanic, but being given your role, can you share with the audience how undocumented students deal with the extra challenge of being ineligible for federal aid? Are there options for undocumented students or any student population that need financial aid that do not require repayment of interest accruing loans? Yes, um, again, this is Brenda Gomez speaking. So when it comes down to the undocumented student population, it becomes hard um, when speaking about financial aid. Obviously, undocumented students or documented students, because they're still undocumented, do not qualify for um, any type of federal aid. Um, and when it comes down to scholarships and grants, there are scholarships and grants that they can qualify for. But a lot of um, scholarships and grants that we know about have one of the prerequisites be that, you know, the student needs to be a citizen or a permanent resident. I'm not saying that all of them do, but most of them do. So it becomes very, very hard for the undocumented student population to find, you know, aid to help for their studies. Um, I'll touch a little bit on myself and the experience that I have both in the private sector and now at UW Platteville in the public sector when it comes to institutions and how they work. Um, I attended Loris College. Um, I am a DACA, well, I have DACA, um, and I was a DACA student, did not qualify for um, FAFSA, which I did not know um, because when I first got to Loris, they made me apply for FAFSA, but it kept saying like I couldn't, like my application wasn't going through. So that's when we found out that, you know, even DACA students couldn't qualify. I mean, I knew, I kind of knew that I wouldn't and I told them, but they still wanted to put it through just because as a, Do as a DACA person, we have social security numbers. And normally in order to qualify for FAFSA, you use a social security number. Um, but like I mentioned, it, there are scholarships, there are grants it's just very hard to find them. And when you do find them, you know, you got to take advantage. And a lot of students aren't willing to go through the process of looking for these scholarships, looking for these grants, even though it's going to help them. Um, even myself, like helping students that I know have had issues with, you know, finding aid, it becomes hard on both ends. Sometimes the student doesn't have enough time. And then when I'm trying to help, I, I don't know what I'm looking for. Like, I don't know all the time what a student, um, what like their, their qualities are and like all the questions that, you know, scholarships and grants ask. So, it's, it's hard because like I try to make lists of, you know, potential scholarships and grants, but that doesn't mean that, you know, every and each student that is undocumented that I work with is going to qualify for them. Does anybody have any additional comments they want to add? Feedback? I didn't touch on um, the part of, you know, students having to take out private loans. A lot of the time when, when you are an undocumented student, you know, your parents are working and, and they, they oftentimes have other kids, so they can't help much. So you have to end up applying for loans, um, 
which normally are private loans because those are mainly the ones that undocumented individuals um, do qualify for, but the rates, the APR rates that you have to pay back on are high. Um, so again, given my, giving myself as an example and putting my, my business out there, I guess, um, when I was a student at Loris, uh, I took out a private loan. Um, even after all the help that I was getting, initially I wasn't getting much help. Um, but then at one point I withdrew because I just could not pay for school anymore. Um, but I did have a support system that, you know, did everything they could to try to find that aid for me. And that's the only reason why I went back to college and even finished. Um, so that's why I say like, it's very hard to find aid for undocumented students and documented students because it's, it's the money just isn't there. And if it is, it's through, you know, grants and scholarships that donors are putting out there that are specifically for students that can't apply for FAFSA or that don't have the necessities that, you know, the 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 things that other other students that do qualify for those things have so well, certainly appreciate you sharing the uh, the uh, personal experience there with us uh, Brenda making us aware of the uh, you know exceeding challenges that you know, DACA students uh, documented and undocumented students um, have to face um, so does anybody have any follow up you know to that any comments um, so what what can they do I, I guess it's really still the lingering question um I think like I said students can obviously look for scholarships and grants that are specifically for students that aren't citizens, students that aren't residents and there are some out there so one of the websites um that I used to check up a lot on and I talk to students about is Hispanic Scholarship Fund. Um, a lot of the time they have, you know, scholarships um, that you don't have to be a citizen or a resident to apply for. Um, you just have to submit, you know, an essay or whatever the case may be. Um, or just looking, looking online like every so often, again, it's gonna be very hard to find scholarships and grants that are going to be for these student this specific group of students but they're out there you just have to like search it, it takes deep searching it really does all right well thank you for sharing that uh brenda um so trying to keep moving um forward here with our discussion because that uh, we have certainly some great points uh that we still want to make sure we're covering um, but at least that allows us to be mindful of the challenges that not only, you know, documented students, but undocumented students are facing. And it's just a, you know, large pervasive issue that um, hopefully, you know, start getting more answers to and at least, uh, you know, people can kind of learn a little bit more about it and have a little bit easier time to navigate. Okay, um, so now once the student has submitted the paperwork for financial aid, and it's accepted at a college or university, they'll have to work with the financial aid office to determine the most appropriate financial aid package for themselves. So this will likely include determining the best type of loan to take and the amount to borrow based on needs while in school and the ability to repay the debt after college. So Michael, as someone who serves as the assistant director of the financial aid office, what advice would you share to students regarding managing their financial aid responsibilities, both short-term and long-term, and the importance of financial literacy in helping them understand and navigate the loan process, both as a student and after graduation. Yeah, thanks, Ray. That's, that's a great question, and it's uh, it's multi-layered, right? It's um, I think you know once a student decides, say, this institution or whatever one it may be is is the place for me, um, cost always weighs into that, and inevitably you start talking about loan options and which ones are out there. And I think our role in this is really helping them understand um, the different loan options that are available. I know Brenda mentioned the alternative loan program and 
And we, we've seen, you know, a number of students have to utilize that option. The Parent PLUS loan program, which is an option that students and families can utilize, but that may not be available to everyone based on credit, you know, past credit and so forth. So, you know, I think it's, it's one of those things, there's a huge, right now, and it's one of the reasons we're having this discussion this evening, we talk about student debt and the amount that they're taking on. Uh, one, of the, one of the issues that I'm seeing with students is really the lack of budgeting skills that they need both in the short term and the long term. Um, and, and I think that's something that has to start much sooner than their first day on campus or when they register. Um, you know, I, I wish our our secondary education, you know, would would have courses like that to help students prepare for college. And I'm sure they talk about it, but something really in depth that gets them onto this earlier on. Um, but what we're seeing is students taking out more loan, more of the alternative loans than they need. Um, in some cases, it's merited to, to help with their living situation. In other cases, uh, I think it's more to have some money for comfort than it is anything else. And one of the, when I meet with students and, and they take out loans, we can never tell a student not to take a loan out. But what we can do is educate them on, hey, here's what I really think you you need to cover your 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 monthly costs or your bill here with the university, what do you really need to get through the next semester? And uh, and that th those answers will be all over the board. Like they vary tremendously. Uh, but really the education process of, of doing that. I think when you start talking about financial literacy, uh, that really comes into play with the budgeting, with understanding that it's not, like where students really get caught with loans, uh, and it's the reason that lenders are probably in business, right? It's not the principal that they loan out that is is the issue. It's the interest long term, and I know that firsthand because every month I have to write out a student loan payment. And when I look at the principal amount borrowed, that's manageable. When I look at the interest that's accrued, um, you know that's enough to, to make you go get some aspirin. So. Uh, I think you have to really help students understand that. And especially, we talked about this earlier with the first generation students and the families that just really need that help understanding this process. I've been fortunate, I think I've been here now 15 years in financial aid. And one of the, one of the exciting pieces of my position is I get to go into classrooms and meet with students. And we're fortunate that professors and educators have brought us in. And I say that because when I go in and speak with them, we talk about investments and what's a good investment versus a bad investment, right? And I think if you're investing in yourself, that's a really great investment. And education is a great investment. Um, if you're taking out loans, educational loans, so that you can go on spring break trips, and I'm not sure that's the most viable thing to do, right? Um, so, so there's a lot of planning, both short term, long term. Uh, someone had mentioned with the FAFSA, you know, the students that that just get the loans, and, and where's their help for them? In my 15 years here, that that is one area that has always frustrated me. Students that are so close to being like Pell Grant eligible, which opens up other options, but then you know that they're they're going to have to take out some significant loan amounts to, to get their their education. And, um, you know, I, I think you you look at, and I think Ray will talk a little bit later about the repayment options for students in the long term and loan forgiveness programs that are available. So it becomes really important that, um, that we stay in touch with students and they stay in touch with us and stay on top of that process. Hey, Ray, can I jump in with a, a follow-up question to that? Sure. Uh, two questions came in. So how are we measuring this? And when we're talking about taking out loans for comfort versus helping to meet extended needs. So how are we measuring that scale? Yeah, you know, when you get into to the measurements of that, I, I don't have necessarily any data other than when I have met with students and had those discussions. Um, I think it, 
it's it's one of those things that I'm sure there's data out there. I haven't had a chance to, to really dig into that. I would also like to ask a follow-up question. Um, I know Laura mentioned earlier uh, subsidized loans versus unsubsidized loans. And my question, Michael, is how often are students let in on the difference between subsidized versus unsubsidized loans? Yeah, that's a great question, Brenda. That information is on our website. And when we meet with students and families at, let's say, um, the, you know, the new student experience, we go through those scenarios with them. The difference is the subsidized loan does not have interest accruing on it while the student is attending school. But that is a need-based loan, so you do have to uh, you have to qualify for that based on the information on the FAFSA, right? And um, so, so that information is out there now. With all that being said, do students take the time and the families to go and do the research on this? Um, you know, half of them do, half of them do not. Uh, our goal is to get to to the half that do not trying to really help educate on this process and, and really what you're getting into um, as far as the, the higher education experience from a financial standpoint. I'll offer a quick tip. I always tell students that unsubsidized loans start with the letter U, and that means that you pay the interest after um, that, you know, the interest starts to accrue and you pay the interest while you're still in school. Good to know. Thank you. Thank you for that tip. The reason why I asked that question is because when I took out my loan, no one ever mentioned subsidized versus unsubsidized. And honestly, I didn't learn about it until late last year. And I've yeah. been in college for about two and a half years already. So yeah, it, it, it's a great, you know, I had mentioned earlier, and I think Laura had maybe brought this up, maybe not, but I think we've talked about it. Um, it's my belief, and for a number of years, I had really openly kind of pined for us to have a class on financial literacy, right? And probably in the last 18 months or so, I've kind of changed my course of thought on that. They need to have this in like seventh or eighth grade. And, and really that's when this needs to start with students to prepare. Because like I said, if, if they step on campus the first day, and they're not prepared for this, that's where the stress of the situation can really set in. Now, that's a huge undertaking for school districts to start that very early, especially with the state of education right now. So um, I'm not saying it's my lifelong mission because I think <laughs> this will take longer than, than maybe some of us are around, but really that's, it's my belief that's where it needs to start. That at that point to help students understand not just what they're getting into, but that this is possible. We just have to take responsibility for it and help them get, get to the end point. I think, um, too, if I could add, Ray, um, sure. that um, knowing that this is a pinch point, knowing that this is something that can happen, right, for all of us who work with students. Um, or if you're a student yourself, um, like making sure, right, that we are including that in conversation, right? That's not just Mike's job to do that. Um, it's my job, it's Laura's job, it's everyone on the panel, it's every, you know, professor, um, you know, if, if you start talking about um, financial aid with a student, right, if that becomes part of the conversation, um, you don't want to pry, but at the same time, right, there's there's golden opportunities, right, to provide those those nuggets of information. All right. Okay, so I don't want to, um, you know, cut this uh, conversation like just right off. Um, there were a couple of questions that did come through. Um, just quickly try to get these answered, and then we're going to move uh, forward because once again, there are a lot of great points to talk about. Um, Richland Campus Foundation has promised $1,200 in scholarships to any incoming student who applies. And the question is, how would this extra funding ease the burden on students of need? Um, so I don't know if that $1,200 
every year or that's just $1,200 one time. I, I'm not sure. Um, I, I, I get the burden, how would it eat the burden at least for one, maybe two semesters, but um, if it's a renewal, like renewing scholarship, then obviously gonna have a greater impact than if it's just a one time. Um, yeah, and, and I would just add to that, Ray. I, I think anytime a student can get gift aid, such as scholarships or grants, it reduces any amount of potential loan that they may have to take out. And absolutely. Helpful, right? Yeah. Obviously, if it's renewable, that's a bonus. Um, unfortunately, not, not all programs can be renewable, but uh, I think any funds are um, that can be given to students, not paid back, that's a bonus. Absolutely. And the second one here real quickly is, uh, what do the availability of last dollar programs, such as the Pioneer Promise, do to make higher education more affordable? Is it more of a marketing trick instead of a substantial program? So I don't know if um, anybody know about the last dollar. Um, the Pioneer I do, Promise. I do not know a whole lot about it. I think students have to be eligible for the Pioneer Promise. I think in one way, it's a way to say to people, we, there's a place for you here if, if you feel like you can't financially make it work. Um, so I, I do think there's probably some marketing there, but, but I also think it's an opportunity to say to people, hey, take a look take a closer look, come meet with us to, to find out. looks like Mike wanted to add something maybe. Uh, is the Pioneer, I guess I need clarification, Pioneer Promise, Pioneer Pledge, that are we talking? They might be the same thing. Um, yeah. They got they said it's a last dollar program, so. Yeah, um, probably, you know, I'm along the same lines as Tammy on that. Is there some marketing to that? Sure. Um, does it help reduce? The debt load when it comes to loans, absolutely. Um, I think it, it's important that, that that those programs are explained clearly to the students and families that that involves tuition costs, not necessarily housing and meal plans. So I don't know if anyone else has any, anything to add to that. Yep. Um, so one audience member mentioned that personal finance is not required, at least in Wisconsin high schools. Um, and they have a strong opinion that it should be. Um, so for them, perhaps their children won't make the same uh, fiscal mistake that they made. And, you know, and I hope, certainly hope that's going to be the same for my children um, as well. Like I've certainly made fiscal mistakes and not understanding the impact of interest and what that really means when they say, oh, you, you know, you can pay back this amount but that's just the principal amount. But then when you throw in interest and then oftentimes just like with credit cards too, like that's a whole nother conversation, but it's kind of the same one and the same, right? Students taking on credit card debt and then, they, oh, I can pay that back. I can pay the monthly minimum, not realizing the minimum going to very little of the principal and most of your interest. And then all of a sudden your debt is just not going down um, and how long that actually takes. So yeah, it certainly would be helpful to be able to get that financial literacy in the school districts. But like you mentioned, Michael, it's a huge undertaking. So that means if they come to college and they don't have it, like Tammy mentioned, then it becomes our responsibility and we just have to be willing to take on that role and do what we can to make sure that students aren't, you know, putting themselves in a deep hole. Okay, so we're gonna move forward now. Um, and so next one is, uh, with being an access institution, many students enrolled here at UW Platteville will be classified as first generation and or low income status. And thus will have to shoulder a larger load of the burden to manage financially while being a student. This oftentimes for our students mean working several hours a week, which can significantly impact their ability to succeed academically. Additionally, as Laura mentioned in the beginning of this discussion, students with limited income struggle to pay expenses and meet their daily needs. This can lead to being unable to cover all fees and costs associated with the university and result in an academic hole being placed on a student. Kaya, would you like to share some best practices or tips for students to be able to balance school and work and discuss the ramifications of having unpaid debt to the university? 
Sure. Um, in full disclosure, I'm also one of those first generation college students uh, and went through a lot of the same issues that a lot of uh, the panelists also talked about. Um, one of the things that is important to remember is that college is a preparation for your future career. It's all about balance. In college, you're balancing your school and your work and the expectations of being involved. You're balancing that with having to make enough money to pay off your debt or pay for your schooling at the same time. And so often students will take on 40 hour work weeks at the same time as being expected to do a 40 hour school week. Um, those 40 hour school weeks tend to be enough time to spend studying and reviewing and reading textbooks and seeing faculty and doing tutoring and, 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 plus being a part, a student for 15 or more hours a day or a week, excuse me, in class. And so um, when we talk with students in our offices about the advising and registration experience, but also the academic coaching experience, um, that academic coaching is asking the student to really think about how do we balance? How do we help you to keep your job so that you can do and pay for the things that you need to without making yourself wrung out at the end of the day or at the end of the week, or that you just feel like you're constantly running? And so um, a lot of things that we do is we plan out a time frame. Um, I think a lot of students really don't think that they should be studying during the day. And so if they're not studying during the day, then they're trying to do the evenings. They're trying to do all of the other things that they're um, trying to work and do schoolwork at the same time. Um, we have a lot of students who also tell us, oh, I have a job where I can sit and really do my homework at my job. Well, that's all great, but how much are you really spending dedicated time towards actually reviewing and learning the material if your um, brain is being drawn to, you know, helping the next customer or looking up and answering a question and those kinds of things. So life is um, about balance. And so if you can figure out how to balance your academic and your um, professional life with working and going to school, you're going to feel better at the end of the day and help yourself to feel a little bit more confident in yourself. And when you have that confidence and you're going to do better academically as well. Um, the challenge that we also uh, find is that a lot of students also end up in this, I owe too much in order to be able to register. And then they feel like there's nothing left for them at the end of registration and that they have to feel like they run around campus or have to be put on wait lists in order to get classes that they need. When in reality, one of the things that we have to remind ourselves and remind ourselves as a culture here on the campus is that, yes, there's an advanced registration period, but it doesn't necessarily mean that you have to register on that date and time. If it takes you a little bit longer to get to that point where you can register for your classes because you need to work a summer job to be able to pay for your back um, tuition dollars and then come back and pay for your future tuition dollars, that's a possibility. But sometimes our students don't are afraid to ask. Um, and it's not just the first generation college students that are afraid to ask, it's a lot of students. They're just very afraid to ask. And so if I can make one plea, there's a lot of really friendly people on this campus. You can see a lot of us sitting right here. Um, come ask us questions. Don't be afraid to ask for help. Um, oftentimes the help is there for those who need it. I always go back to the Harry Potter quote um, directly from Dumbledore himself, right? Um, that the help is always there for those who need it. And so there are helpful people in financial aid. There's helpful people in the TRIO office, your advisor, your faculty, even people in the cashier's office who want to take your money are very, very friendly and helpful. So if there's something that you anybody can do on campus to help you to work with you to manage your debt, to help you to figure out how to do things differently so that you can have that success and that relaxation at the end of the day where you don't feel run out, please always ask. Um, I see Jeremy's nodding because Jeremy and I have been on an adventure together for a very, very long time, and I appreciate his insights into things. And those are the kinds of people that we have on our campus to be able to help. So ask for help, find the balance. If I can give you those two walkaways, those are the things that are important. 
Thank you, Kaya. Does anybody have anything they want to add to that? Or share? Well, I, I can certainly say, uh, talk from the perspective of being a professor, um, you know, having students, you know, that have to work. And that was one of the things that I had to learn, um, like, you know, about the student population here is that, wow, a lot of students do work and they work a lot of hours. Now, that doesn't mean you have to, you know, lower the standards in the classroom or anything like that, but you just certainly have to be mindful of the time commitment that these students have to give um, to be able to work um, and so in order they can, you know, meet their financial um, capabilities. Now, Kaya, I did have a question as an advisor, though. So you talked about the advanced registration period and that you can work and then come back later. But uh, there's are cases though, like if you if you're unable to uh, register for a course during that advanced registration, it may end up getting full and close, and now you can't get in, and that can really have a wreak havoc on the student's progress for towards graduation. So, what could a student do in that kind of scenario? Like, what may be something that kind of balance that they need to pay, but they can't afford it right away, but at the same time, if they don't get to register for the course, they may not be able to take that course until the following year, which can really wreak havoc overall. Yeah, so the very first thing that came to mind was the fact that, um, you know, unfortunately, sometimes at the end of May after grades are posted, classes magically start reopening. Um, and it happens to be due to another issue on our campus, which is that um, students fail classes. And when they fail classes, that may mean that the next step for them isn't available to them anymore or that they can't return to the university because of that dismissal. And so oftentimes what we spend a lot of time talking with our students about is just because it's not open right now doesn't mean it won't be open at some point. And so it's being proactive. It's going into pass and looking on a regular basis to see if that class opens up. Does that department have a wait list that you could be put on a wait list for? Um, really thinking more broadly about, I need this class right now, when in reality, you don't need this class for another six months. So what can happen in the next six months that can open you into that class? Can you go to the department and ask for permission later to get added? Can you go to the faculty member and can that faculty member add you to a class? Um, so there's a lot of really, it's that hurry up and wait kind of mentality that we need to try and get out of a little bit of the high pressure to get the classes to get done and get, you will get done, but it may need, may need us to be a little bit more creative about how we're doing it. Um, Mike Hoosier and I were having a conversation earlier today, and one of the best things that he said to me was, have you filled out your FAFSA? And so sometimes if a student has those higher debt loads or can't register because they haven't paid off their enrollment, it could be simply because they didn't fill out a FAFSA or simply because they didn't complete a step in that process. And so what if we had you fill out the FAFSA? What if we had you do the steps that you needed to do that are on your to-do list? What if we asked you to just do it because you don't have to accept it at the end, the aid. You don't have to accept any aid. You can say no to it, the whole package if you want, but you don't know unless you ask. And so it gets back into that. Why don't we slow down? Why don't we look at our options? Let's figure out where we need to go. And are there other options that will help you to get to that point, that same point that you're looking to get? So it's just working and asking and slowing it down until you get to the right place. All right, thanks a lot, Kaya. Um, so we've been mentioning how, like, and you put a plea there, Kaya, to you know the audience and students, like you know, ask for help. But oftentimes, you know, they, you know, students might feel nervous about you know that conversation. Maybe they might be scared or anxious um, with you know having to deal with all of that. Um, at the same time, as faculty and staff, we may not know, we might have presumptions or assumptions about the students and their situation and, you know, or what we would expect them in terms of their financial status or, 
anything of that nature and figuring, well, what they're just probably they're just working because they want the extra money in their pocket when the reality is they're working all those hours because that might be the only way to get their next meal. Um, food insecurity is really high on this campus. So there's a lot of anxiety and it's a very emotional topic for many students. So I'd like to um, you know, pass this forward to Tammy mm -hmm. um, and have her you know, kind of talk about you know, the issues with students and the fears that they have related to you know, just having this debt and the ang anxiousness is feel um, that they have with, have, um, with debt, as well as just addressing assumptions that people may have you know about the other in terms of the student with respect to the students and the students with respect to the faculty and staff mm -hmm. um and just about student advocacy yeah so thanks thanks ray um dr pew there i'll be i'll be official how's that sam <laughs> raise my friend too so it's hard right um but i want to give him his due respect um so um the thing that i would say um about advocacy, and it, it kind of goes along with what, what Kaya was talking about there, um, is you do have to be your own best friend, right, through this process. And I know it can be challenging in some families, their family cultures, you don't talk about money with anybody, right? And I think one of the reasons why people may choose UW Platteville as a school is because we are who we are, right? We're here, we wanna help you figure out how to navigate this. And I think just to remind students or to remind them on the call tonight um, that there, there are great ways to sort of say, hey, Laura, you know, I, I know you offer this tutoring program and it's hard for me to talk about this. And Laura would be like, oh, come right in you know, sit down, let's talk, right? Uh, and I would do the same and Dr. Pugh and, and Mike, Mr. Hughes, Huger, right? I'm gonna start calling everyone formal, Mr. Payne, right? We, uh, you know, we, we would all say, oh, come on in, right? Um, and it's okay to say, hey, I'm, I'm nervous about this, right? Um, and we're all in this, on this call and many of us are soft places to land. That's what I like to call us, right? When, when things are feeling really scary. Um, and so, you know, advocacy for yourself is one of the most important tools that I hope students walk away with from our campus. Um, you know, just to just to ask the questions, right? Um, and 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 find, you know, Kai and I've worked on this. Find your five people. Find your five peeps, the people who you really can trust. And it might not be me, and that's okay, right? It might not be Jeremy, it might be Dr. King, right? Or it might be, you know, the cashier's office, what, you know, whoever you've made that personal connection with. Um, and so just, just start asking the questions and, and advocating for yourself. I think that's super important. Um, and the other thing, you know, to remember about the closed classes to kind of, you know, con combine this is, it's just a tool for us, right? Um, we have to manage our classes and so that way we don't over budget. And if all of a sudden we feel, you know, we notice that there's a lot of students who need X class, we typically try to make it happen, you know, and which is one of the reasons why we call our list a request list rather than a, a, a wait list, right? Because your request, that doesn't mean we can always promise it, right? And, and lots of students will, um, sign up because they want a better teacher or whatever, right? Um, and so we got to sort through that, but it's a request list, right? Um, and it's just a tool for us to be able to, to try and meet the needs of our budgets as well here on this campus. Um, and the other thing that, you know, I've wrapped my head around and Laura and I have talked a little bit about this um, at different times is there are a variety of social services um, that many students are not aware of. Um, you know, for example, um, the Workforce Development Office, um, which is on Water Street here in Platteville, near, near the golf course, um, near a dental office. Um, there's a lot of programs that some of our students might qualify for. And it's a lot of, it's a lot of paperwork and a lot of red tape, but in the end, if it's able to help you be successful, in education, um, it's a resource I know that is highly untapped um, for our students here. Um, and that area of the world speaks a different language. <laughs> I'm trying to figure it out too, um, so that I can best serve students in that way. 
Um, also, the Department of uh, Vocational Rehabilitation, the DVR, right? There's there's a, a whole host of social services that either we don't know about or we're afraid about what that means about us, right? I'm going to be one of those people, right? Which I would never say that, but some of us, some some of you might. I don't need those services, um, and this is this is the reason why we have them is for people who um, who need them, right? Um, and your taxes, my taxes, all of our taxes pay for those, and I certainly want those services to go to people who definitely need them. So um, remember, they're they're you know, if there's a will, many times there's a way, right? And I really appreciate Brenda's um, comments earlier about being persistent, right? Um, and using those resources. The other thing that I wanna say for faculty and staff is don't assume, please, um, uh, what a student's fi financial status is, right? Um, just by how they look or how they respond. And, and often when a student comes in, I'll just say, so how are you doing? You're, 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 you have enough food, you're feeling you know, comfortable in your spaces, right? Kind of just giving them that opportunity to share with me if something is not going well in that area um, of very basic needs so that they can, you know, that I can open them up to those resources. Um, and I do that for almost every student, right? Not just based on, you know, what I know about them, their grades or how they look or whatever the case might be. Um, just don't don't make assumptions about, you know, what, what they're able to or able not to do, right? Um, the last thing that I wanna address is the, the fears related to debt. And, and we've talked about that a lot. And I also run in, in, on this, on this uh, webinar tonight, but we also run into students who are deathly afear, afraid of debt, right? They're willing to work X number of hours a week so they have zero debt by the time they graduate. And that's an admirable goal. But at some point, right, and that I was this person, right, worked three or four jobs in college. I could have had better grades and had a better educational experience if I would have just had a few small loans, right? And so for the students coming out of college of EMS, the average salary for students is 62K, right? And if you pay four years worth of tuition, uh, it depending if it's in-state or out-of-state and international, all those sorts of things, your return on investment will be 0 0.5 to 1.0 years, right? Like you'll appreciate, right? It's not like when you buy a car, right? The value depreciates, depreciates when you drive off. After you get your degree, you should be appreciating, <laughs> right? You should be able to make money on the investments that that you have um, that you have made. And so I see people, right, who go way overboard. And then I see others who are like, listen, you know, this little bit of a loan here can really serve you very, very well. Yeah, I appreciate you mentioning that last uh, point there, Tammy, because there's certainly times I had, I see students and I would say like, if there was only a way that they did not have to work that many hours, and, and like I said, I don't know the, the full situation as to why they work those hours, but almost, you know, invariably, I say to myself, like, you know, there was just a way, like, you know, if they didn't have to work those few hours, it could make a huge difference in how they perform in my class, just their overall experience, and then just making them a better candidate when they graduate, which then just adds value to their return of investment. And so just trying to inform students that, you know, it's okay <laughs> to take on a little bit of debt if the trade-off is, you know, getting better grades, enjoying your college experience a little bit more, and then just being able to, you know, just have a better, um, you know, better grades overall. So there are a couple of questions that uh, came through. Um, these will probably be geared a little bit towards Mike. One's more rhetorical and then one's very specific. Um, and so the first question is about the issue of previous generations having more access to grants and fewer loans as opposed to today where students actually only get like they only have access to more loans and in those loans are higher um, over the past decades. Um, so that's uh, kind of that rhetorical question there like so there's been a change in the free money and now it's money you got to pay back um, and then in in the exponents list of university budget 2020-2021, 
It lists a fair amount of extra student aid and student job assurance, retention and salaries. Um, is, that help, is that helping out during COVID-19? And is our university getting enough federal funds and state funds during this whole process? Good questions, um, and I'll, I'll do my best to, to answer some of them. Yeah, as far as receiving funds from, from the government, yes, uh, with the CARES funding for students and, and so forth, we've, you know, that, that's been a huge benefit during the, the past year and, and with the pandemic and so forth. Um, I, I can't honestly answer the, the next part of that question, Ray, with the, the savings and retention and, and I'd have to get clarification on that with with uh, with that question um, and, and savings from work study and so forth. Um, but, you know, the government, they've, you know, we have CARES funding for students that need it. Um, Laura, you might be apt to speak to that a little bit. Um, well, we've had two rounds of federal funding um, that we've dispersed to students for um, emergency grant assistance. Any student who has completed a FAFSA is eligible for that funding. And we are students who have not completed a FAFSA. We are supporting in the same way through our foundation on campus. So um, we're about at the end of our second allotment of funding from the federal government, but we're anticipating getting a third round in the near future here within a, um, the next month, I would say. So students would have had the opportunity to receive three emergency grants um, that were federally supported by the end of this academic year. All right. So um, we got it. Uh, probably the general public can see it in the chat where Emily here is, you know, saying a little bit of pushback here, and this is what conversations are good to have. And so she states a good point. Look, is accruing debt necessary for us to understand the value of our education? Or have we made it necessary? And so we end up conflating the two. And I think that goes to um, with a question that was posed, and it was actually by uh, Dr. King, you know, the fact that over the years, We've been getting, you know, less and less grant availability and students having to take out more loans. And is there a reason why that has been the case? Um, it's just something that. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's a great question. And, and having, like I said, been here a while and seeing this over time, uh, the day to day cost of living, the educational experience has become more expensive with with technology and, and so forth. I don't know that in some cases, grant programs have been cut. The federal, you know, Department of Ed, the federal government, they've actually increased the Pell Grant amounts, but, and, and to some degree, they've increased the ability of students to be eligible for that. Um, but it's a concern without question. It's a concern we all see. And, and I'll give you some perspective on it. When the Tri-State Initiative Program started out, and I, I distinctly remember this because I was in, I think, Kaya, you and I were maybe in admissions together at that time, going back a few years. Um, if students were very high need, you know, they could come very close to covering the whole bill with some, with the direct loans, Pell Grants, and so forth. Um, the cost of education has gone up, folks, and, and you can't deny that. Um, but the government has not added a lot of other programs outside of the Pell Grant to increase those amounts. So that's where there becomes some serious issues. And I think in the long term, um, with some bills that were passed recently with changes to the FAFSA, that may change what those details look like. I, I'm not sure. I know one thing I've mentioned to students when we've met with them, either in classes or over Zooms, they really have to pay attention to what is going on in DC with, with loan programs, grant programs, and be alert to that. So, um, you know, is it, is it, um, is it great with, with the cuts that are going on? No, absolutely not. All right. I want to make sure we leave enough time um, at the end here, you know, do give due time for Mr. Payne. 
Um, but very quickly, I'd just like to give a little bit of pushback to Emily's response about the, is it necessary to approve debt? I, I think there's a balance, right? I think there's a trade-off that we have to take into account because um, I think the chancellor today was just having a discussion. It was about mental health, you know? And I think if you're working 40 hours a week, is that worth it? The anxiety, the stress, the, the, you know, the impact it has on your grades, the possibility of having to retake courses, which means you're going to have to work even more or be in school longer because you're just unable to, you know, persist through the, the uh, uh, academically, which invariably could mean taking out more loans while still working more, which adding more stress. And so I think we, I think each student, it's going to be different for each student, but I think each student needs to at least take the time to weigh those options as, is it worth to work? Or perhaps it may be better in the long run, at least personally, at least for my mental health and my overall well-being to maybe I should just take a small loan and trust that my education and return of investment will be worth it and pay that off. And there's no right or wrong answer per se for each student, but I think it's something that each student will have to evaluate very seriously. All right, all right, go ahead, Emily, you can clarify. <laughs> Okay, so I think um, so my comment was more to the notion that I felt was brought up in that uh, accruing debt instills a, a value in one's education and that debt um, is then conflated with with the value of, of the degree that you receive. I'm no way saying that. Okay, I, I think that we've the the system has been made in such that it's almost necessary that you have to accrue debt and that you have to um, really scrape by to receive an education. But I don't think that for me, um, I was pushing back particularly on the piece that debt is somehow related to one's uh, value or pride in their education. I'm not sure that I am in agreement with that. Okay. Did you want to say something, Tammy, to that? Because I think that may be coming from your thing about the fact that you worked three jobs, four jobs. And you felt a sense of pride, you know, that you were able to pay for your education. Yeah, um, I think I think it comes from our family cultures as well. So um, certain family cultures um, value that differently than others, um, and in mine particularly like even asking for help was very difficult. Um, you know, like we talked about before. Um, so, I, you know, um, that was the norm for me is I have to pay my dues, right? Like Frank is saying, this is, you know, even when I got my first job, um, I had to take a job on third shift, even with a professional degree. Um, and I was, I felt indignant about that, right? Like why, why I went to college, right? Um, and part of it is, you know, my cultural upbringing and what my family instilled in me in terms of, you know, you, you pay for it, right? You, you earn it, right? Um, and, you know, that, that's very real for many of our students because they come from you know, Southwest Wisconsin or Midwest. Um, and some of it's part of the, um, you know, it's part of the, um, what's the word I wanna use? Uh, American culture, right? Um, about how you pull yourself up from the bootstraps, right? To be successful. So um, sure, right? There was a sense of pride uh, for me being able to do that. Um, and I, I came, to college with that, right? Um, and um, not everybody will come the same way I came, right? So um, I guess those are my comments, yeah. All right, All right. appreciate that. All right, so I do wanna make sure we get to this last point. So having conversations with students about the topics of financial aid and debt and helping them navigate the process is very important, but also very challenging. Following up with Tammy's points about how you ask questions of student situations matter, uh, one particular approach that could prove effective in having such conversations is that of a love ethic. Jeremy, would you care to inform everyone as to what love ethic is exactly and how we as faculty and staff should demonstrate it? 
and what students should expect on their end regarding a love ethic approach. Yeah, Ray, can you hear me well on that end? Yes, we can. All right, excellent. Thank you so much for having me. I realize we are getting close for time. And so I will try to um, zip through some of the important points that I would like to highlight. And I feel as if a lot of the stuff that I have in my notes have been covered throughout. And so um, let me start by saying um, this has been incredibly emotional for me, right? To be here with you all and to sit in the fields and thoughts and ideas and have these conversations around student debt, right? I come from um, a background where I would describe as a no income background and had to navigate the college experience, right? And I, I, I recall very vividly the first time my mother had to call the financial aid office, not at Platteville, but at Southern Illinois in Carbondale. And I remember she tried to explain the context for what it means to come from a no income background. I remember the financial um, director was saying like, what does that mean? How does that look? That's, how's that even possible? And my mother said it with the most broke, I'm getting emotional now, wow, I didn't expect this. Um, she said it with the most broken voice. We do it one day at a time, right? One day at a time, right? And, and when she was speaking to that, she was alluding to ways in which we were paying for our needs in the household that aren't always documented, right? Through governmental entities, right? And so, you know, my mother babysit, she babysat, she did, she did hair, uh, we bartered resources, you know, we, we got really creative, right, to meet our needs. And so as I sit and listen in and hear stories, um, I empathize and I feel connected with many of you, uh, but I also feel a lot of emotions and I, I don't think I'm unique in this. Um, as I speak today, I, I want to share that my thoughts are not my own. They're not original. I have a, a compilation of feedback and, and things from um, students, staff, faculty, and surrounding community members. And so I'll elevate that throughout. Um, to Ray's point, I do want to talk about this idea of um, love ethic, right? This idea of extending love ethic to the students that we serve, but also having that be reciprocated in building relationships. And so um, I'll kind of work through my list. I I'm going to look, I'm gonna say it right out the gate. I'm going to look down a lot because I have a lot of things that I just wanna make sure that I do cover. And so the first point that I would like to cover um, is, is just the implications of utilizing the financial aid office and, and having student debt just in general. And throughout, you're gonna hear me allude and reference um, some of our most minoritized students, right? So when I'm speaking, I'm, I'm really talking about black and brown students having a compound of low income experiences. And then from time to time, I'll weave back and forth through our broader student population, right? So I do wanna make that uh, very clear going forward. And so the first thing I just wanna say that, um, you know, in a typical perfect world, a college student would come, pay their, pay their bills, and be transitioned on within their experiences. Oftentimes with um, our students who have um, incredible debt, the relationship with the financial aid office is ongoing. And it's constant. And it's not like a, you know, one and you're done, right? And in, in addition to that, um, there's a lot of tension around this idea of conceding that your, your, your financial need is not met and that relationship needs to be maintained throughout your, for the most part, right? Throughout um, a significant portion of your school experience. And so with that, there comes a lot of internalized tension, a lot of emotional strain that comes with that idea of, be, of being connected to the financial aid in that way. In addition to that, um, I remember uh, when I went to a social work conference um, at UW-Madison here recently, and they talked about social services in general and what that means for minor, minoritized communities. And when I think about the financial aid office, I think about broader um, social services that people have to navigate, right? And so with that, know that our social services in society have been far from perfect in terms of affirming and upholding dignity and respect and humility when working with some of our most marginalized communities, right? And so I, I think in my humble estimation, I truly believe many of our students come and they interact with the financial aid office and they are shook they are afraid. It is very um, reminding of experiences that their families navigate right in the broader world. And so I do see a lot of that carry over. And I just I just want to highlight that. Um, in addition to that, I just want to highlight something that Mike talked about. He, you know, he brought up some excellent points about just wages in general in our society are stagnant. College fees and hidden fees are on the rise. Um, it, it leads you to wonder, you know, in all of our marketing and in all of our campaigns is 
college truly affordable? And even if you say UW Platteville is one of the most affordable, to what extent could we could we truly say that with confidence, right? As a broad sweep, and I, I think um, some of our students have tension with that. And so I want to highlight the emotional impact of um, having debt and some of the interconnectedness of of of, um, of how it impacted you, right? And so when I think about student debt, I think about the, it's truly a ripple effect in terms of how it impacts you, right? It's, it's not just the debt and meeting with people and having um, to build relationships and, and be on and moving. It, it's a ripple effect um, for, for navigating school with student debt. And so some examples I just wanna provide that comes to mind is that, um, Many of our students come to campus, right, with their financial aid packages not complete, and then they and they, and, and and in that process they're meeting students, they're hanging out, they're engaging in, in programs and things of such. They're already like literally steeped in this stuff, right? And then you may capture an email here or there, a reminder or something that truly just knocks you off of that, you know, that transition to college. And I think that's something we should be mindful of. It's a it's a it's an incredible traumatic thing, right? When Laura said. Oh man, I felt that Lord when you said, what did you say? You said um your mom called you and said that you may have to come home. That's a real thing for many of our students when, when they're not able to figure out um, that the financial aid situation early on. Uh, I talked about higher education, uh, but I want to also talk about the social services connected to higher education and just acknowledging that whether we like it or not, UW Platteville in many ways, college institutions are extensions of societal, helping to meet society needs, right? And so I think we're no different than our K through 12 school systems who are already spread thin and who, who already take on, you know, many responsibilities and requirements, right? Um, I, I kind of chuckled to myself when you all said, yeah, let's have the teachers take on something else, right? Have them teach financial literacy. It's like, dude, they teach it everything. They're raising your kids, they teach it everything. <laughs> they do a lot. And, um, it, it, sh it just becomes a lot. And so I say this to say, uh, we just have to be mindful that many of our students come with needs and higher education serve as a, a, a social service in many ways, right? To, to help meet unmet needs, right? So when it comes to meals, shelter, housing, all of this is um, something that higher education is able to provide as an extension for their holistic support. In terms of um, financial aid and experiences of navigating um, services, I, I do just want to share that um, just in general, when we're working with our financial aid entities on campus, there is, how do I say this? There's reservation, I would say on my end, right? When I'm sending students off who I've developed relationships, who I've built trust, who I've um, built um, you know what I mean, like a, a, a close knit situation. Sometimes there's, there's worries. I never know what's gonna happen on that other end. In my mind, I would love to say with complete confidence that we all get it right. We're trying our best and we do well, but I think oftentimes we fall short of that. Um, there's, there's an unsaid rule on campus, right? Not unsaid, it's just unsaid messaging when working with students of uh, making sure that we, if you're sending students to financial entities on campus, make sure you get them to this person, right? Make sure you get them to that person because they're going to work it out. They're going to extend some empathy. They're going to be patient. They're going to put in the time that they need to help them under, understand to the full extent, right? But I know that that's not all sweeping for those financial services. And so I, I, I just highlight this to say, like, we have to work on some of these things. Um, I think about our students when they're meeting with financial entities and and how some of those experiences feel and I, it's something that comes up often in those engagements is the concern to to share their struggle story and to feel um, pressure to do so to, to leverage and get things and so um, I just want to highlight that oftentimes students who come from um, my door ties experiences who have um, who who, um, who come from low to no income backgrounds I just want to share that when they're meeting with financial aid to share that struggle story, know that that's not their first time doing that, right? We're asking for students to, to, to sell their worth through admission. So then they're, they're sharing the struggle story there, right? When they get on campus and they're meeting people, that's the second time kind of to some extent sharing it. Then you get sent to the, you know what I mean? The financial aid office and you may not be met with the response that you desire. And that is an incredible 
draining, like emotional drain to not have a reaction or response or be upheld with dignity and respect um, th um, through the context of that process. It, it can be straining, right? So I'm keeping with this idea of emotional strains and connections to finances. Uh, when, when we were talking earlier today about students working jobs for 40 hours, that's a, that's a real thing. Oftentimes our students work two to three um, and, and, and it's real. Right, it's not realistic. Whoever said that in the chat feature was spot on. Working forty hours and doing school is not possible. It's not a perfect situation. And in a perfect world, we wouldn't require for anyone to do such a thing. Right? It doesn't make sense. But this is what it is. Right? And so, to the best of our abilities, we offer up um, suggestions on how to to best navigate those systems. Um, another thing I would like to highlight, particularly for our Black and Brown students, when you come in. Uh, from low to income background, you have student debt and you got to take on, um, you got to cut corners in terms of how you get meal plans and, and, and housing. I want to share that many of our students who come from that particular profile have to take on your traditional housing. What do we know about traditional housing? They are the closer knit they're on top of each other. And then when you have minoritized students amongst a predominantly white institution, they're hyper visible within those spaces, right? And so what I'm trying to I'm trying to connect the dots is like, it's just, a, it's, a, it's a domino of effects, right? And so you're streamlined to your traditional housing, you're hyper visible. And when RAs and RDs are interacting and engaging, it's like, I promise you, it's hover. It's hover, it, it's a true problem. And as of late, I've had a lot of students reach out um, in regards to some of the challenges of just being hyper visible in those spaces and um, taking on, you know, discipline things for, you know, music may be too loud or I hear some of the silliest things running too fast, you know, doing college things, but that's just some of the, the ripple effect of, of how things are interconnected. <sighs> Y'all, I'm working through my list. So get, I'm getting to the, I'm, I'm skip over to the love ethic part, right? And so my call to action for, for all folks is to consider this idea of, of extending a, a love ethic. And it, this is um, coined by Bell Hooks, who's a black feminist scholar out of UW Madison, right? And she defined love beyond fluff. So when I say love, please reject the fluff, the, you know, for my true blues in the room, stick with me. So when I say love, it, it's this idea of extending oneself for the purpose of nurturing one's own and another spiritual growth, right? When I say love, I'm talking about love as in action, ex, as in choice, to extend and honestly express care, affection, responsibility, respect, and commitment and trust, right? When I say spiritual growth, I don't mean something mythical. I mean something internally that when it's nurtured by our campus community, faculty, staff, and students, our students will be able to be fully self-actualized and fully engaged in communion with our campus, right? And so with that being said, this idea of love ethic, I call on us to consider a few things. One, I call on us to work to eliminate these dynamics and conditions for which when we're working with students who have income challenges and need to work with financial services, we got to get to a place where we're not only sending our students to Mike. Reality, we, we got to get to a place where this love ethic is being extended amongst the entire staff and we can trust and know that our students will get what they need out of those dynamics and not be broken down um, you know, from, um, from experiences within those dynamics. The other thing I wanna share, I wanna share that I recognize, and I, I appreciate you Tammy for elevating this earlier about staff and faculty needing to be the, the, the middle ground sometimes to support students through financial situations. My call is to, I think we need to expand um, black and brown representation within the financial aid office. I think it needs to be a full-time job. And I think their only job <laughs> needs to be to make sure students get it right and understand it and walk away feeling good. I, I truly, truly believe that I don't know what the hell that would look like or what would it would need to take to get there. But I, I truly think that could be an important piece. And I say this because I know for a fact, a lot of our advisors across campus, a lot of our um, student support service areas are spending a great deal of time in meetings talking about financial aid items. 
are walking through the process like extensively, speaking on the phone with parents and caretakers, right? Having the student step away and come back. And literally it could take up three to four hours within your day and then the day's gone. On top of being required to produce programming and things of such, it's a daunting task for many. And it's an emotional, it's, a, it's an emotional coaster too, to support students. So I, I call on us to consider, um, you know, looking into maybe finding some representation in the multi, I mean, not the multicultural, <laughs> in the financial aid areas. I also call on us to consider what I would describe as our floaters on campus. These are people who come to school with, with from low to no income backgrounds. These are students who work two to three, four jobs. I'm, that's hyperbole. They work maybe two to three jobs. That's a real thing, right? And they literally sometimes stop out, not drop out, they stop out sometimes, right? To pick up more jobs to pay bills. And they live and they float amongst this community. There are a ton of black and brown folks who still um, take up space in this community and they're just floating. My call to action uh, particularly for student success areas, is to consider um, the dynamics for students who come, who are here, who stop out, come back. Like extending that support for our floaters, I think, is a tremendous um, thing, um, especially with the context that oftentimes when students stop out, it's not always just like not going to class and doing the right thing. Sometimes it's that and having to work, having to work two to three jobs or supporting family back at home, right? And many of our students are intergenerational. So there's, they're sending coins everywhere. Um, so I think that's something we should be mindful of. Um, final three points that I have uh, for our students who are listening in, be mindful of who you share your struggle story with, right? Don't just be out here telling everybody your story for story's sake. I, I, I say this to protect you socially and emotionally, right? Be very particular, be mindful. You'll know who they are and how um, they present themselves early. And you'll know who they are by how they will continue to work and reach out and to connect with you, right? And so if you share, if you share your struggle story, make sure that some policy gonna get changed, right? <laughs> make sure that something with the practices are gonna be different um, and make sure, you know, maybe the love ethic might be operating within that. And um, yeah, just make sure it's transactional. You get what you need out of those dynamics. Oh. Early on in the presentation, I remember it came, it came up talking about uh, pulling out loans, right? And making sure you're doing it for the right reasons. The one thing I just wanna say for my students who are listening in and for staff and faculty, our students, um, are deserving of playful dynamics in college. They're deserving of joy. And, and I'm, I'm gonna just be real with you. Sometimes pulling out a loan, right? To, to go on a vacation may be important. I wouldn't even say may, may be important. It may be significant, right? When you, you have minoritized students come to institutions that are literally not designed in every aspect that you can imagine for them, sometimes taking, stepping away for a vacation, when getting beat up on, when being ostracized, when being separated from family and loved ones, it could do a good thing for the long game, right? And so I, I, I just do, I do want to elevate that because I think far too often students get stigmatized, right, for, for pulling out too much, you know, and, and we hit them with the literacy, but we don't talk a lot about the social, emotional and connections to that. And, and I think that's something we got to be thinking about. The final thing I just want to share is that, um, and I know somebody talked about it, uh, maybe it was you, Brenda, you said something about oh, the donors, private donors sometimes elevate. We need to get, I don't know what the system or process is for that, but I know, and I have seen private donors bail some of our students out, but I know that that has been at the expense of discretionary, right, discretionary, like at someone's leisure decision or someone who had a connection with students, but I know all of our students aren't always connected with the right people. So I think, at some point, we need to look at the private donors, look at how we're determining who gets access to these things that aren't on the website, aren't on the web page, and, and, and broaden that, right? And I, I just want to share in closing that when students are working with you all, they don't have to always be nice. They don't always have to be kind. They don't always have to have the right words when they're communicating with you, because oftentimes they won't. Right. I, I think we still have to we got to get past the respectability, you know, in those dynamics. Right. And, and not um, 
not give students truly what they need, you know, regardless of how they show up when they're requesting for things. And so at this point, I'm done with my ramble. This was cool. Hey, thanks a lot, Jeremy. Um, I had, you know, noted to uh, Emily that, hey, you know, we're going to go over time, but I think the students needed to hear what you said. I think we needed to hear what you said and uh, I appreciate every aspect of it and, you know, appreciate the call to actions and hopefully as a university, you know, we could start putting some of these action, call to actions in place. And hopefully you students that are uh, students out there that are listening, you know, that they heed your advice. Um, and that they understand that, you know, they're not alone. And like Tammy said before, you know, there are some certainly some soft landing spots out there for you. Uh, and same as Kaya said, you know, try to seek help as best you can. Um, you know, we are here for you. You know, our job is to, you know, help you succeed. And that's certainly what we want to do. We want, we want you to succeed. The last thing, the worst feeling we have is you come and you have to stop out, you know, or drop out, you know, um, we want to make sure that you're succeeding because if you're succeeding that reflects you know the university and that reflects the job that we're doing and we love those feel good stories too you know we we want to have them as well just like any teacher you know they, they want those feel good stories that's why we come for the job because we want to make a difference right. and you know if you're going out there and you, you, we're able to help you succeed and navigate through and you know and, and be successful in life that's going to keep driving us to you know be the best that we can be so please 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 like we've all said you know please seek for help you know act do not try to do this alone it's not easy it is very complex we are there for you and we want you to succeed thanks so much so if anybody has any closing comments we will wrap up this uh, panel discussion Look like that'll be it. So once again, I'd like to thank all our panelists for their time, for sharing their input, uh, their thoughts and advice. And I'd like to thank uh, everybody in the audience, um, you know, for chiming in. And of course, Emily and Kaden for help elevating this pioneer talk as part of the MCIC. Thanks a lot. Thank you all so much. Have a good rest of your evening. Yep. Thank, thank you, you, everyone. Take care. Yep.